Welcome, welcome, welcome to another You Insider Under the Visor Sooners podcast, and not just any podcast, a spring game, post game podcast where Oklahoma just had a big game. I don't care what the score was. I'm just going to be straight up honest. I think the Red ended up winning at the very end uh, with um, McCown, uh, I guess, running it in. The scoring was loopy, Parker. It is what it is, but it was fun. You got to see some really cool things, and I think the resounding answer to everything about Dion Burks has been answered. That dude is a bad, bad man. Dion Burks. <laughs> oh, oh man, Brandon. That is going to be a fun chess piece in this Oklahoma offense in 2024. And we saw a ton of Deion Burks today. I mean, I th- I'm fairly certain he led the team in receptions. I would have to double back, but it seemed like the ball was getting thrown his way a lot. And that was only somewhat natural because you have Jalil Farouk on the shelf. You have Andrew yeah. Anthony on the shelf. Nick Anderson didn't play. But to think that all of those guys are going to be healthy come August 31st. And it's, it's not just going to be Deion Burks that has the potential to be an absolute menace in the passing attack for the Sooners. I think... Yes, Burke's individual performance was impressive today in its own right, but it's also oh so tantalizing to think about this Oklahoma offense and it, particularly the aerial attack and how strong and how versatile and how unrelenting it has the opportunity to be in 2024 if all of their keystone contributors are indeed at full health. So... Here, here's the very first drive, 64 yard touchdown. Um, and it was Jackson Arnold to Deion Burks. The second drive, and this is where it, it felt like the defense started to kind of assert itself a little bit on the front, uh, the defensive front, mind you. Ethan Downs' very first play. Head away on a reverse, right? He he gets him for like an eight-yard loss. Jacoby Johnson, Makari Vickers were at corner. They essentially shut down the outside for a good portion of that spring game. They did a they they were so good that Venables was like glowing about the cornerbacks and the presser. About I couldn't be more excited about the cornerback room. We're so good at that room. We have the most talent we've had. Yeah, I mean, he was just going on with superlatives for him. And so uh, that I think it showed on the second drive. That said, so did Caleb Hicks. And and before we even get to Caleb Hicks and his running, I want to give Salt because they 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 limited Salchuk quite a bit um in his touches. But did he not look like way more explosive? Perfect analogy for Salt Chuck Parker. He's Kennedy Bur- Kennedy Brooks with a burst that Kennedy Brooks could only dream of having. Man, I like that. And I think there's a lot of truth to that. Yeah, Gavin Sawchuck. Patient. Oh, I just kept writing down Gavin Sawchuck is so patient. Yeah, and you know, I don't think he's gonna have to be the workhorse in Oklahoma's backfield in 2024 with what we've seen from Hicks throughout spring ball and what they expect out of Sam Franklin. But if that dude needed to be a workhorse and if ultimately it suits Oklahoma best to just deploy that guy in a workhorse capacity, boy, he is going to be productive Yeah, because he just churns out yards, man. And that's kind of, it was kind of the same thing with Kennedy Brooks, right? You just always knew that, no matter if it was going to be four yards or eight yards or 20 yards, he was going to be headed in the right direction every single time he touched the football. Yeah. And, and and so he, he had a good, he had a good spring game and he caught passes out of the backfield, made some big yards, scored a touchdown. Um, The play, I think it was drive three that saw Chuck got in the end zone, but it was a play before that on like a third down, where they handed him the ball. And I remember thinking Stone, and I believe it was Strong that got in the backfield, and it looked like he was dead to rights. 
And all of a sudden you see him just patiently wait and wait. And here comes the pull and blocker. Boom. Hole opens up. And there he goes bursting through the second level, gets tripped up after about 15 yards. The very next play, the very next play, he goes into the end zone. But the drive before that, Caleb Hicks had a big drive. He had several big runs, you know, eight, 10 yards. And then he had that big 30 yarder that I believe Jaron Canick went the wrong way. <laughs> but um, that I, it, that, that hole should not have been there. I'll just say that there was a linebacker there and then the linebacker was not there. But um, needless to say, I thought Caleb Hicks looked good, Parker. Caleb really Hicks good. did look good. He looked great. And obviously, I think you saw he, on his 30 yard touchdown run, I think that's when everybody, that's the moment that everybody walks away from the spring game, uh, kind of replaying in their memory as to what Caleb Hicks accomplished and to, you know, what their perception of Caleb Hicks is heading into 2024. But he had a, he had a series of real tough physical runs, uh, kind of like you touched on there. He just proved to be a really difficult guy to bring down. And on that touchdown run, uh, he showed some burst. He showed that, you know, yeah. you give him a seam, you give him a wrinkle, he can take full advantage. And that tracks with, again, everything that we have seen and heard from Caleb Hicks and on Caleb Hicks throughout the entirety of the spring. He's certainly taken a big step towards being a cog, a significant cog in the backfield picture for the Sooners. Now, before we go any further, folks, I uh, want to remind you that this episode is brought to you by Manscaped. Now, call them what you want, knee knockers, golden nuggets, thigh slappers, etc. But our friends at Manscaped refer to them as the boys. Not every man has children, but every man is responsible for their two boys below the waist. When your little guys have more hair than they need, trust Manscaped for all of your grooming dreams. Boys need love too. So join the 10 million men worldwide who trust Manscaped by going to manscaped.com and use code INSIDER for 20% off and free shipping. You heard it here first. The boys are back in town. Every man knows how scary it can get when going for a close shave below the waist. That's why I trust Manscaped for all my sensitive areas. Introducing the Lawnmower family, including the Lawnmower 3.0 Plus, the 4.0 Pro, and the 5.0 Ultra. Yep, three ball trimmers. Isn't it awesome? Boys need love too. And for this reason, each trimmer is equipped with skin safe technology, an LED spotlight, and unique features for different grooming needs. Oh, these babies are waterproof too. Need I say more? So for the basic trim, go with the 3.0 and work your way up to the 4.0 and 5.0 for the ultimate grooming experience. Taking it on the go, Manscaped has you covered. These trimmers come with a travel case and even a travel lock feature. Once again, you can get 20% off and free shipping with the code insider at manscaped.com. That's 20% off and free shipping with the code insider at manscaped.com. For the best your boys have ever looked, trust Manscaped. There you go. Um, Were you able to keep it together? I was looking at the ad copy and not your face. Did you? I did. At all? I did. Well, impressive. You know, I got to tell you, there was a tweet. I, I'm not going to read it publicly that caught my eye um, about offers. I'll just say university tells me we chilling on offering 26 right now. My timeline five plus 25 off 26 offers from blank university SMH. Oh, I know. I know which tweet you're referring to. Yes. Yeah. Um, I can almost guess that university. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I think I can guess the player in question, too. But we'll, um, we'll get around to recruiting. We got plenty of recruiting stuff yeah. to talk about. No question about it. But uh, getting back on track here. You know who really impressed me today on the defensive side of the ball with those those three freshman safeties, man, Jaden Hardy, Reggie powers, and especially Michael Boganowski, yep. Michael, but Bo Michael Boganowski is a hitter, man. That dude did Lay not in carry the, the spring game today. He was head hunting. I love it. And like, it, he did draw a late hit flag, uh, on a, on a play on the sideline where he did hit Caleb Hicks a little bit late. And Josh Bates came over and got in his face and, 
it all blew over rather quickly. It didn't really turn into anything, but Boganowski, man, he had a couple of those plays where I, th- I forget who, I think it might've been Burks that broke into the open field at one point. Boganowski saved a touchdown with a perfect, perfect mm-hmm. form tackle. Yeah. And he got Bauer sharp, hit him right under the chin. Oh man. Across the middle. I mean, that is, that is everything that you hoped Michael Boganowski would be when he committed to the university of Oklahoma. That's exactly what Brandon Hall hoped Michael Boganowski would be when he offered him then a zero star recruit in mm-hmm. January of 2023, you hoped he would be a linebacker playing safety. And that's exactly what he looked like today. He looked like a guy that had the ferocity and certainly the size of a line. He's huge out there. <laughs> he looks, he doesn't look out of position playing safety in the sense that he doesn't know what he's doing or that he's not fast or reactive enough to play the position, but he does look out of place in the sense that he's just really big. He yep. looks like a linebacker, yet he plays safety and plays it very well for the most part. Yeah, you know, um, I'll he wasn't say perfect that, today. No, but. no, but nobody, the defense as a whole struggled some. I mean, uh, when I say struggle, I want to kind of rein that back a little bit, a little bit. Struggle is a, kind of a strong word because the defense was really good, particularly the defensive front. So, um, but with Boganowski, man, I even tweeted out that he was just killing dudes today. Like just, he was on a mission to knock dudes heads off. And I, I, I respect to Brent Venables, the ref called the personal, it was, it was a clean hit originally, even when, Josh Bates been good on Josh Bates for going and defending his teammate. Right. But it was a clean hit and Brent Venables, you know, kudos to him for declining the personal foul penalty because that he wants his guys being aggressive. Cause I think it kind of set the tone for Boganowski in particular, because that was his first hit. Right. And he got called for personal foul. Brent goes, no, we're that we're not that that was good. We're not going to call a personal foul on my kid being aggressive like that. And it allowed Boganowski to kind of sit there and go, okay, they're going to let me play ball. Let's go play ball. And then he was just knocking dudes' heads off the rest of the time. And I, I think that's when you're going into the SEC, you need that. I thought he and Reggie Powers were so physical today that if you're an Oklahoma fan, you look at that and you go, okay. After Billy Bowman leaves, after RSJ, Peyton Bowen leave, whenever they all head to the NFL, because all three of those will be in the NFL, write that down. You got three other NFL dudes waiting in the room, waiting in the wings and Jaden Hardy, Michael Boganowski and Reggie Powers. So, which by the way, like I, I want, unbelievable. To, I want to give Brandon Hall his flowers. That's what I was about to say. Yeah. He is not somebody that we probably talk about enough on this podcast or elsewhere for the way that he has recruited over the last couple of cycles. And obviously when we do talk about him, it is in reference to his recruiting efforts, mm-hmm. but I think kind of going back to what I just mentioned, The evaluation aspect of this, to me, is really brought home by what we saw from Boganowski today because that Brandon Hall is obviously very seasoned. He's been in the game for a quarter century at this point, so he knows what he's doing. He knows what he's looking for. But still, that's how you know you got a good one, that you got a guy in Brandon Hall who can look at a high school linebacker playing out in the middle of central Kansas and say, yep, I want that guy playing safety for me. That's remarkable. Yeah, and and, I mean, I think two others come to mind. Remember how early he was on Amari and Robinson and Jonah Williams? Yeah. Those weren't big big names up to that point, and he goes out there and he offers them. I mean, Marcus Wimberly, another one that he evaluated – saw and said gotta have so um that that safety room 
is in good shape. And I thought Eric McCarty looked pretty good back there, by the way, today. Like, Eric McCarty wouldn't. He didn't play. But, okay, 29. Who was 29? Why did I think that was McCarty? 29 is Case and Kalmus. Case and Kalmus. The whole time I was like, man, that's McCarty out there. How do you think <laughs> I, I didn't have a roster in front of me. Um, I knew every number except for him. <laughs> and I just assumed that is, is it racist that it was a white safety? So it had to be McCarthy. <laughs> there you go, folks. There's a racist among us. It ain't you and it ain't me. That's what we learned tonight. Uh, I was like, well, he, he made a few tackles and they didn't even hear. I didn't, when they even announced it, I don't think I even heard them say case and Calmus, even though he made several tackles. By the way, speaking of, there were multiple people that didn't know who Owen Heineke was in the press room. That cat was making plays everywhere. Yeah. Did you tell today. him he's going to learn today? Yeah. Like that dude was balling today. I liked it. He's Kobe a McKenzie. good athlete. He's yeah, a really Kobe, good athlete. He's put on weight. He came in as a safety, put on weight, moved down to linebacker, and he looks really good at linebacker. He looks um, natural at linebacker. Yeah. It's super natural. Um, Kobe McKenzie looked good at linebacker today, by the way. He did. I thought he looked no question about really, it. Really, he had really a really good. strong spring, quietly. He yep. had a real yep. strong spring. Still under 230 pounds. He looked. He actually came up and talked to me as I was walking out of the press room today, and we had a short conversation, but he looked really good. He's really happy about where things are at. Um, I thought Danny Stutzman looked good, obviously. Lewis Carter looked really good. Um. You want to know who looked really, really good on the defense? That and Jacoby Johnson, like he made some great cover plays, man. And I gotta tell you, man, like that is one big corner. That is a ginormous corner, Parker. And just like we had heard. Prior to the spring game, when a source flat out said he might be the most talented cornerback to come through Oklahoma in nearly two decades. Most talented. When that's talking size, running, you know, being able to move in space, uh, being really good at uh, playing the ball, having great ball skills. I just thought he looked really good. I, I I thought Vickers looked good. I thought Eli Bowen looked really good. I mean, it doesn't matter how big you are, Eli Bowen is going to get that ball out of your hands. He did it twice, Ivan Carrion. Carrion's coming down with it, and, and Eli Bowen just rips that thing out. Like, he's just a good player. Like, he's just – he's going to be good. He's very, very savvy. So, I, I, again, that goes back to Venables. Just He just likes the back end of his defense. He loves it, actually, and he talked about that. But at the end of the day, did anybody have a better day than Grayson Halton on defense? Oh, I, I'm glad you said on defense because I was about to say yes. Deion Burks had a better day than everyone. No, on defense. On defense. On on defense. Yeah, you can make a case for Grayson Grayson Halt, and certainly a PJ terrorized that second team offensive line, which that second team offensive line is not good. At least not right now. They they got issues. They got some stuff to figure out. And naturally, when you're going up against a five star prospect the likes of PJ, uh, you're going to have your hands full. But uh, yeah, PJ ate that second team offensive lineup. So PJ is certainly in the running for me amongst guys that had the most impressive day on the defensive side of the ball. But Grayson Halton was also real good. Well, look, I have the stats here. Um, defensively, Boganowski led the way with six tackles. I want Heineke with two. We've already or with five. We've already brought him up. Oh, Jared shoot. Boganowski led the team with six tackles. Dang it. He's the next Jordan Mukes. Oh, don't do that. 
Not do that. Um, it's exactly what happened in 2021 with Jordan Mukes. He led the team. Yeah, but tackles. Mukes did that against like the fifth team defense or offense. So there's a big difference. That is true. Um, Tongue in cheek. Yeah, I got it. I got it. But there's going to be people that are not watching that did not see your smirk when you said that. So Case and Kalmus with four. So we pretty much talked about the first four guys. Lewis Carter, really good game. Mm-hmm. Uh, four tackles. Ethan Downs had a big time. The, I think he's going to have a good year, man. I do. He looked, he, he looked like Weatherford Ethan Downs, like like freshman Ethan Downs, like just twitchy. Well, I'll say this: he looks like I don't even know necessarily how to quantify it. He looks like a senior. I guess is the best way I can say it. Like he looks like a well-developed, savvy college football player. Mm -hmm. When he was a freshman, he was getting by on athleticism because he had a ton of it and he could in that defense. Right. And then sophomore, junior year, he was good, but you could tell he hadn't really like hit his peak yet. Hadn't really hit his ceiling. Mm -hmm. The Ethan Downs I saw today looked like the best version of Ethan Downs that I've seen so far in his career in Oklahoma. I agree. That gives me hope that come this fall, we're actually going to see that Ethan Downs on fall Saturdays, as opposed to a spring Saturday. That gives me confidence that, you know, we, we saw a second team, all big 12 guy in 2022 first team. He was right. He was first team, all big 12 last year. Second team again, right? No, he was first. Was he first team? I thought it was second team in, 22 first team in 23 to my recollection but like okay you, is he, you're probably right well i'll go with that that sounds is he a first team all right. sec guy i don't know that look that that might be shooting a little high but mm-hmm. uh definitely somebody that again i think you're going to see the best version of this fall i agree um the sam mccullough look pretty good you want to know here's the thing Caden woolard as he gets more and more ingrained into the defense, he's going to be a really good player for Oklahoma. He's going to end up with I, – I bet he ends up with four or five sacks at the end of the season. I think he's that good. But R. Mason Thomas looked like the old R. Mason – the R. Mason Thomas that we expected is what he looked like. Like he was always in the backfield causing problems. He was chasing Michael Hawkins down from behind on a couple of occasions. Michael Hawkins just ran out of bounds. He's like, yeah, I'm good on that. Um, but Sammy Omosigo at the cheetah spot, he looked, he looked good. And yeah, he was rotating with McCullough and Kendall Dolby. But from what I was told by multiple people, multiple people is that if things go right for Omosigo and he really picks it up come this fall, if he gets on the field, he will never relinquish that spot. <laughs> never relinquish. Yeah, that I spot. was I was very impressed by again just the way that he looked today because when he was on the field, what little we saw of him last year, he looked like a freshman. Mm-hmm. He looked like he was not fully developed, like he was not fully comfortable. He looked like you expect a freshman to look. Yep. <laughs> he looks he he looks like he's aged five years in the last five months. He looks so much more impressive physically. He looks so much more at home. And I, I guess just the term would be intelligent, not to say that he wasn't before, cause he's a very intelligent football player, but he just has a better cognitive understanding of what he needs to do, how he needs to operate at that cheetah spot. And yeah, I think yeah. he's got a very bright future, very bright future. Now, how much of his potential does he realize in 2024? Again, I don't know. And I don't necessarily think you have to bank on it all coming together in 2024 because you do have Kendall Dolby at that cheetah spot and you do have other guys that you can rotate in there. But Samuel Masigo, before he's done at the University of Oklahoma, is going to play some really, really freaking good football. You can bet on that. Take that to the bank. No, I totally agree. Another guy that we haven't – well, Jaden Jackson looked just really good. I mean, he was causing problems. He wasn't exactly getting TFLs or sacks. 
Uh, Grayson Halton kind of took him from him, but that's fine. That's part of it. Collapsed in the pocket. I think he caused a lot of problems. David Stone had a sack and a few few tackles as well. He looked really good. Um, I, obviously, PJ just was really, really good. Uh, he there was, I think there were two other sacks that PJ could have had that they just didn't like. There was one where he literally hit Jackson, like had his arm, both arms around him as Jackson is throwing the ball, or before he even threw the ball, and then Jackson threw it as PJ ran by him. Um, and BV just let it go. You know, it was like a throw, first down, third down throw to, to Jaden Gibson over the middle. Uh, but speaking of quarterbacks, Parker, flip to the other side. I, I thought Jackson looked in control, right? He looked comfortable, but he also didn't go against the first team defense every time. So no. you also have to take and that into consideration and Hawkins did and his stats show that that he went against the first team defense with the second team O. So Boy, anybody he trying had no to, time. He had no time. He had no time like, ever. Like I felt so bad for that kid. I did I was too. Like, that was oh. my point. That's my point, man. I was like trying to say is like anybody trying to say anything like oh all that hype or whatever. No. No. When he does well, he has a first team offensive line in front of him. That second team offensive line versus that first team defense, they're going to terrorize first team O lines all season. Now, now, now think about that. That's OU's backups. They're going to do that against Alabama and Texas and all of that. They're going to cause problems. You don't think they can't just do what they want against freshmen? Yeah. I mean, come on. Yeah, I I thought it all in all was a pretty solid day for Jackson Arnold. I will say he missed some pretty easy throws that you, you would like QB1 to make consistently, mm -hmm. like without exception. Then he but hit again, the tight like window ones too, man. He it was did like hit weird. the tight window ones. Yeah. He did show some nice touch on those deep balls. That one to Jaden Gibson at the very beginning should have been caught. I don't know why Jaden Gibson didn't lay out for that one. That one... <laughs> dropped six mm -hmm. inches in front of him is what it felt like what it looked like but obviously he goes on to hit burks three plays later and all is forgotten uh again the throws he missed for were for the most part very makeable throws it seemed like he was able to place all the difficult ones where they needed to be but mm -hmm. uh sometimes missed the layups which okay like he's again he's a sophomore right now he is not as polished as he's going to be next year or the year following. If he's still around, like he's still growing into everything that he can be as a passer. So there will be mistakes. There will be, he's going to leave some things to be desired in his play. It's just the reality. He's not going to be flawless. Mm -hmm. He won't be flawless this fall either, but 10 for 20, 233 yards, two touchdowns, man, you'll take that all day long yep. the spring game. And I think having the core of receivers that he's going to have this fall very much alleviates any concerns I have about uh, some of the small mistakes that he made in terms of placing the ball today, because when you got a group of guys, that's that talented, they're going to leave you much more room for error than you would otherwise be afforded. And so I thought today for the most part, was exactly the type of that day that Jackson Arnold needed to kind of build some confidence, not only in himself, but in those receivers, continue developing that rapport with Deion Burks and see what it looks like in full speed with fans in the stands, simulate that game environment. Uh, all good things for QB1 today. And then, again, I, I think it's very, very difficult to I, – I mean, you can't really say that Michael Hawkins – blew anybody away today because he didn't but could anybody in his position have blown us all away i i, I don't no. know whether you can make any judgments about exactly him as a player based on today because I, I i'm frankly not certain how anybody in his position could have been expected to succeed he did about all he could given the hand he was dealt and and, and i think 
Oh, you fan, you also need to take in consideration that they couldn't run really. Um, the second anybody got within three feet of them, they were blowing the whistle. So the fact that Jackson and Michael and in the same vein, you know, General Booty and Casey Thompson, they're all gonna use their legs quite a bit. That's that's part of their game. Yeah, General Booty's got wheels. Hello. He does, <laughs> yeah. And and so when you take those away in a spring game and you put that blue jersey on these guys, you don't really get to see the full aspect of what those players truly are. Because Hawkins, I promise you, would have probably ran 60 several times in those situations. Uh, Arnold, there was a couple plays where he started to run. He just realized it was stupid because he can't get hit. He can't make anybody miss. He can't do anything he needs to do. So he would try to force a throw instead. And that happens in a spring game. But in a real game, those two, and I'd probably throw Casey and Booty in the same, you know, sentence, you know, progression one, two, and three aren't open. Bye. And they're going to take off and go get what they can. And they're all fast. So there's that. Um, I thought outside of Burks at receiver, the most shocking thing was the fact that Bauer Sharp didn't get a ball. No, he didn't. Or, which is but, kind of disappointing. Like we but all wanted... is it okay? Here's the thing. And I, I I I think they did that. I think that was strategic because you don't want to show that you have this tight end. You can people can talk about it all they want, how good he's been, and he's catching all these passes and doing this and that. But there's no film of it. So you don't know how what routes he's running, how they're using him, how he's getting open, and what what uh you know what route combinations you know they're running to do that. And there's so many things into it that I think it was strategic on Oklahoma. I did I did were you surprised that Devon Mitchell didn't touch the field all that much? I mean, I'm not I I was surprised that it was Cade McIntyre with the second team and not Devon Mitchell. That was surprising to me. Um, just because, you know, with everything we'd heard well, about. We've heard, yeah, but we've heard some things about Mitchell. You know, he's had an up and down. He's still learning. Man. Yeah, he's certainly. Certainly. And I think that, you know, that's just as much of a credit to McIntyre as yeah. it is kind of a, you know, it's a surprising revelation about Mitchell and where he's at right now in the pecking order. But I think there were many, including myself that would have expected to see him just based on the hype factor, uh, running with the twos as opposed to McIntyre. But, uh, yeah, he was with, he was with the third team for the most part today. And all fall um, camp to change that. That is true. That is true. Um, yep. Yeah, so it, I mean, did he did he record a reception? I I don't seem to recall. No, no, he didn't. No tight end. Oh yeah, yeah, yes, he did for minus three yards. I forgot. Oh, that's no good. <laughs> okay. Well, do you that's not why remember I don't that? Remember he, looked, he looked. He looked. He could look kind of lumbering a little bit to me. Like he didn't look like the Devon Mitchell we saw at Under Armour and throughout his high school. So I still think he's having to readjust some weight, that bad weight that was put on. And I think once he gets in the groove of things and understands the work that has to be put in, he's going to be that guy. He's going to be elite. So there's just, there's got to be this, it's really hard for freshmen to come in. Uh, and some struggle to start, but a lot of times those kids that struggle end up changing after a year or two. We see it all the time. There's there's a there's always that breaking point that changes everything and it's like a, and they grow up. I mean, Nick Benito is a prime example of that. He was known as Bonehead Number One when he first got to Oklahoma and completely changed that. Yeah, I mean, shoot, Nick. Um, as the as the story goes, Nick Benito didn't really want to get back on the flight to Oklahoma after the Orange Bowl in 2018, which was the conclusion of his freshman year. And boy, how things changed for him over the three seasons that followed. 
Yeah, no, I agree. Um, so on a negative note, you want to know where I'm going with this? A negative note. What was bad today? Unsurprisingly bad. I mean, that that we haven't talked about yet. Yes. Uh, Tyler uh, Kellner missed a field goal. Yeah. Is that where you were going? Yeah. Kicking sucks again right now. Oh my god. Can they find a kicker? If Zach, here's the thing. If Zach Ugh. Schmidt is the one that misses that field goal, nobody bats an eye. But no. the fact that it was Keltner, who has had such a good spring, too. Yes. Except nobody's seen it. Now what they have seen of Keltner is he pushes a 45-yarder wide left, and it's just – and naturally the narrative is, oh, boy. Here, Here we go with those three point losses again. again. <laughs> three point losses again. They never end, Parker. <laughs> oh man, I I don't know. I I really don't. I don't know who ends up kicking for Oklahoma Week One. As much as just... as much as nobody wants to hear this, like I think the safe money is on Schmidt just because he's done it and he's the most experienced. Open campus tryout. I mean. <laughs> No, I no, like Liam, like I like Liam Evans. I I do too. The, the issue but, is I don't think the staff, I don't think Doug Deacon, I don't think those guys are going to rush him along. I like I don't think their best laid plans involve Liam Evans being the sooner starting kicker as a true freshman. But you know, if you get far enough down the road and you don't have a solution, think about 2004 with Trey DiCarlo and Garrett Hartley, right? Bob Stoops yanked the red shirt off Garrett Hartley and said, get the hell out there and make kicks. And that might have to be what happens with Liam Evans at a certain point. Uh, I hope, I hope, I hope Liam lives up to the hype because he was a stud in high school. Like you knew anywhere from 50 yards in was like almost out of automatic. And that's what you need at Oklahoma. You can be a 50% guy from 50 yards to 65 yards. Like nobody's going to hate on you for that. It's that 50 to 10 yard, you know, 50 to 30 yard range, 25 yard range that if you're 75%, that's not good. If you're 50%, that's horrible. If you're 80%, you can kind of live with that, but there's going to be those games that you lose by three. You would like them to be in that 85 to 90% range, 40 to or 50 to 25, right? 20 yards. Like that's kind of where you want to live. OU hasn't had that, not since, oh my gosh, who was the guy that just never missed until he kicked a burrito? Um, Burkich? Burkich. Kicked a burrito, and he, he got the yips after that. So, um, they haven't had anybody since him. I guess it's only been three years, but it's been a long three years with the special teams. Phil Coles, man, <laughs> feels like a lot longer. Um all right. I think that, I guess overall, I think Oklahoma looked like we thought they were going to look like a good football team. I thought they looked like a good football. I thought they looked deep and they looked very talented across the board. Yeah, what And to me, Brandon, what we saw largely confirmed what we had seen in yeah. the viewing portions of spring practice. Like the two major takeaways today are – Deion Burks is oh, a real freaking gosh. deal. And the second team offensive line has major issues. Yep. Which again, we we all knew before we walked into the building today. I was trying to get a I was pulling my phone out as fast as I could to get a photo of that. You the your face that got froze. It was hilarious. Bummer for those that don't know. All right. Let's talk about the visitors, Parker. There are so many visitors on campus right now. There's good news. There's good news coming. Sorry, got the hiccups. This podcast is dropping Sunday morning. So expect good news today. Potent potentially multiple bits of good news yes. today if all goes according to plan. Correct. There could be a couple of high school names pop. There's a couple we're watching. 
there's one that we know of, but there's a couple of others we're watching. Sparky, you know who they are. And then on the transfer side, I think in the next 72 hours, you're going to know some things. So be on the lookout. Um, Have some notes coming up on OU Insider VIP talking about uh, Bronson Hickman, uh, talking about... um, Obviously, Jermaine Lole, and then obviously talking about Williams, who is the big name on campus right now as far as defensive tackles goes. Uh, Dominic Williams is – right now he has visits lined up to Texas on Wednesday, Tuesday, Wednesday, which we already reported on OU Wednesday. We talked about it on the live on Wednesday. I told you guys. Tuesday, Wednesday, then he's going to Colorado after that. What Let changed was the LSU visit. That that wasn't in the cards originally, and that kind of changed a little bit. Go ahead. Let me ask you, Brandon. Is he in Austin on Tuesday? You think when Tuesday rolls around, Dominic Williams is rolling up in the 40 I acres? I don't. Not right now. We'll see. I, I, I don't want to get anybody's hopes up, so don't listen to me. Don't listen to me. Don't listen to me. Um, <laughs> don't listen to me. If, I don't. Uh, let's From just, what I'm hearing, I think Oklahoma is working diligently to try to make that not happen. In a world where Dominic Williams doesn't make it down to Austin on Tuesday, what are the Todd Bates haters going to do with their lives? If he pulls off Lole... And Williams, and adds to that what we saw today with Halton and Jackson and Strong and Stone and Devon Sears. My gosh, we didn't even talk about him earlier, but he was voted the most improved on the defense this spring. And it showed in the game. He had a sack and multiple tackles for losses. Like, yeah. That defensive tackle room just went from good to great real fast, real fast. You had some game changers to an already room full of guys that are, you got young game changers and then you've got guys that are just consistently going to make plays for you. Yeah. This is starting to look like kind of a Clemson esque defensive line. If that is pulled off Parker, if I want to keep saying, if, that is pulled off. I keep harping back on what Josh Pate said on late kick when he said, there are going to be some teams that become contenders that people did not view as contenders after the spring transfer portal session. Now I ask you this, Parker, if that takes place, if, 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 if we're going to keep saying if, because we don't want you all to go, well, Parker and Drum said that Williams is going to commit. Look, things are moving in the right direction. OU's got to close the deal. they got to close the deal tomorrow. If he leaves, it's going to be a bear to get him to commit. I'm not going to say it's over, because I think OU is going to continue to play ball with the NIL and everything. It's just going to be much, much harder. So you want to get this thing over with quickly. Now, Parker, they land Hickman, they land Lole, they land Williams. Does the University of Oklahoma become a SEC title contender, and does the University of Oklahoma become a team that is top six or seven, top one through seven in college football by season's end? The answer to your second question, I think – I. I mm, I have an easier time saying yes to question number two. And I guess question number one, we need to define our terms. SEC title contender does not mean SEC title front runner. Yes, I think Oklahoma with those additions is an SEC title contender. Yeah. I think George is the obvious SEC title front runner. Yeah. So yeah. when yeah. I say or when Brandon says they're an SEC title contender, we're not saying they're on George's level. Or no. we're not saying they're suddenly the team to beat in the SEC. They can they, they I, can make the game. 
is where we're going. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. That's, that's, I that's think it's best with. like to me, it's as simple as adding Dominic Williams. If you add Dominic Williams, you can play with anybody in the SEC with the possible exception of Georgia because they're just kind of on a different level right now. There's not another team in the SEC, Brandon, that I would say is significantly more talented than you. There may be a team here, a team there that you can argue has an edge. I I would say add Dominic Williams, and there is not a team that is objectively, unambiguously more talented you, than you in the entire SEC, save for Georgia. So, yes, I think at that point Oklahoma is an SEC title contender. Mm-hmm. I think they are a top 10 team in college football with Dominic Williams. And the reason I think this is such a big addition if it comes to fruition for Oklahoma is because Dominic Williams is going to make everybody's life easier. Brandon, having a dude like that at defensive tackle, yeah. it has a trickle down effect and a big one. Yeah. No, it's the numbers that he is getting offered right now are absurd. Absurd. He is unequivocally the top defensive tackle in the portal. I know there are people that say Bauer. Is it Bowers or Bar- Barrows or Burrows? How would you pronounce that, Parker? The Michigan State kid is Barrow. Barrows. Okay. Barrows. I know some people just will Barrow, argue that. singular. Barrow. Some people will argue him. I wholeheartedly disagree. Mainly because I've seen Dominique Williams twice in the last two years, and he was just so good. <laughs> so like I just don't I I it. Things change for you with him in a major, major, major way. Things change for you. If if you miss on him and you still get Lole, I still think you've positioned yourself to be way better defensively. I think he, he is really good as well. So, Yelan Hickman, 33 starts at SMU at center. So, now you've solidified your center spot for good. You don't have to worry about, is Everett going to come back? Is Everett not going to come back? You've got him for good. If you get Hickman, the SMU center that's in town. So then you, you when Hatchet gets healthy, bam, you get Hatchet. And Venables, you know, he expects Hatchet to be a major piece for them this year. You got Sexton at left tackle. You got Wei Wu at right guard. And your right tackle is going to be Jake Taylor as things stand today. You feel pretty good about that. Feel pretty, pretty good about that. And then you go to the defensive side of the ball. If you trot out Dejon Terry and Dominic Williams as your starting D tackles, because remember, you didn't even see Dejon Terry today. Parker, that's what makes things even more interesting. You didn't see Dejon Terry, and then Brent Venables goes at the presser today and says, as of Friday, Jaden Jackson and David Stone are well over 300 pounds. Things you like to hear. Yes. Like, there's just, there's a lot of positives going on there. That if you're an OU fan, you look at it and go, so this is what this is what it felt like back in the 2000 to 2010 or to 2015. You always had D tackles up until that point. Like OU always had a good defensive front. It somehow got lost for like seven or eight years in the muck. It kind of came back in 2020, 2019 to 2021. They had decent defensive fronts, really good players. Ronnie Perkins, Jalen Redman, you know, Perrin Winfrey, Nick Benito, Isaiah Thomas. We can go on and on of NFL guys that they had, but 22, eh, 23, eh. It's kind of back, Parker. Like, 23, they were okay. They were better last year. 
much better. You saw what they could be talent wise. One, they couldn't stay healthy. That was a problem. But I, I think they've built such good depth through the portal and through recruiting that now you look at it and you're like, okay, if one goes down, it's not the end of the world anymore. Like you're not going to see a big drop off from this game to this game because somebody's injured. Like when Dejon Terry got nicked up last year with his ankle, you saw the drop off, right? After Texas, he wasn't the same player for a while. Like that's just the reality. And neither was a defensive line because he wasn't able to do the things he needed to do. Now you saw today, Dejon Terry's not out there. That's cool. Grayson Halton's better. You have Jaden Jackson. You got David Stone. You got Marcus Strong. You got Devon Sears. You're going to be all right. You're going to be all right. You throw those two or one of those two into that fold, you're feeling pretty freaking good going into the SEC with the defensive front. And again, we keep saying this podcast and podcast every time. Just hasn't been that way. So that's why we talk about it so much. It's been a long time since you've seen defensive line talent like that. And you look at the 25 class, they already got it. They're restocking again. They got, and they're not even playing a lot of their studs in the 24 class, Parker. Koye's not out there a lot. Nigel Smith's not out there a lot. Like they're still short, some guys, Parker. And so they've got. They've got more talent coming. It's coming. It's just not there yet. So, I don't know. Um, have you heard anything else about other recruits on campus? I know we've got the one commit that we've talked about. And I, I got a quote from said commit and stuff. And I know other people do too. That we'll have all that on OU inside. There's a bunch of stuff coming on this commit. This commit will be a five-star when the time comes for that moniker to be thrown on people in their class. Promise you that. Would you agree? I would very much tend to. Agree. I talked to some people in our industry and in, in, in industry from across other networks and our network. And they all said the same thing. Five star. Yep. Five star. Yep. He's. <laughs> this is big. It's a big he commit. Is real. No matter the class. Yep. No matter the class, it's a big commit. Um, have you heard anything else on any other visitors? Just yet? I've heard, and I'm working on confirming it, that Max Granville was in College Station today instead of Norman, which, Ooh. if so, that doesn't bode well. That doesn't necessarily... Because yeah, he's always been an OU guy. Well... Or felt like that way. It, he's he's visited two schools significantly more than the rest, OU and A and M. And when you have a date where you could be one place or the other place, and you're in College Station as opposed to Norman, I'd like like obviously that isn't that isn't the opportunity or that isn't the juncture where OU waves the white flag on that kid, no. but it does kind of start to give the sense that maybe A and M is better positioned there than Oklahoma, but Oklahoma extended an offer today. And I didn't even realize they hadn't offered the kid yet, but yeah. Darius Afalava. Yeah. That surprised the, me, dude. The, the <laughs> number one player in the state of Utah, number 199 overall in the 2025 class, number 23 among offensive tackles, according to rivals. And what's interesting is uh, he goes back a long way, apparently, with Anthony Agumaro, the kid from Elgin, the three-star offensive mm -hmm. lineman. Apparently, they overlapped in Hawaii, which <laughs> just bizarre how, the, how many connections there are there because – when Anthony Agumaro moved to Elgin, his initial, like he had already been following OU football for quite some time because he had grown up around Dylan Gabriel's family. And so oh, wow. he just follow, kind of follow the dominoes on that one. But uh, it'll be real, real interesting to see, especially getting in the game this late with a guy like Afalava, what kind of headway Oklahoma can make. I do think that it's interesting that they would throw that offer out. Obviously if they had offered him like a year ago, which I, I thought they had, then yeah. it's a different conversation, but to have that guy at the spring game 
and to offer him today at the spring game is interesting considering who else you're in on right now at that offensive tackle position in the 2025 class. And so, or you may I, think you're going to lose. Well, and to me, and this is kind of the, this up. is kind of the dot, uh, the dots I'm connecting. Ty Haywood hasn't been in Norman in nine months. Yeah. He's been at Texas A&M a lot since then. And so a plus B looking like it equals C there. And that makes the offer to Alpha Lava make a lot more sense. And if Agumaro ends up a sooner and you can kind of get, cause he commits on May 21st, that one's over next month. Yeah. That one's over 31 days from today. You can get him working on Alpha Lava, maybe get him back in town for an official visit, see where things go there. Then at that point, theoretically, you have four offensive line commits if you can swing things with off a of lava. And then you kind of go all out, you know, balls to the wall to see if you can land Michael Fasusi or Lamont Rogers. Yeah. I mean, if you if you can pull off a of lava, I, I have to say I know that OU had Samoans coming through there since about 2005 right but it's become more of a thing and i think particularly since brent venables and his staff got to oklahoma if there's anything that you can say like everybody wants to say well dylan gabriel had limitations blah blah blah. dylan gabriel was an integral piece of oklahoma rebounding and becoming what where they are now on that same note, I think you have to look at his sway in the state of Hawaii and just within the community of the Samoan and the Tongans, right? I think it is he's opened doors for Oklahoma that were not there. They may have been cracked, and a couple were slipping through the cracks and going to Oklahoma, but doesn't it feel like there's more interest from just – the Samoans and the Tongans across the country than ever before since Dylan Gabriel became a integral piece at Oklahoma, Jaden Jackson, right? Like they've, they've almost landed how many others they've got multiple. Cecilia Kana. I mean, there's so many, like it's just changed. That's my point. It's just changed. So you've got to give credit where credit's due. Like he opened the door for Oklahoma into a culture, into a, into a, a, a group of people in America that really wasn't looking at Oklahoma all too much. I mean, I, I CJ, IU, uh, Dylan from that like, those are the only two I can think. And, uh, Neely, Casilli, uh, uh, Nila Casitata. Is that how you say it? Oh, Casitati. Yeah. That's tight. Those are the only three I can think of prior to the only three or four I can think of prior to BV and Dylan Gabriel arriving. And now you've got a lot. I mean, it's just, it's very much changed. I think that and it's a positive thing, by the way. Yeah. Super positive thing. Uh, By the way, <laughs> Emmett Jones is a bad dude. Yes. Image like, and I don't know how he ends up rounding out the 2025 class, but Emmett Jones has given himself options. Cortez Mills, top 100 player in the country, number 77 overall in the 2025 class. Love the very first visit to Norman today. I'm still working on touch and base with him firsthand to get some insight on what he enjoyed, how the visit went. But the word on the street is good vibes and yep. he may ov he may be back in town for the champion barbecue which will be huge because with cooper perry off the board you'd like to have another guy uh to kind of give the hard sell to on that final weekend when you're kind of hoping to put the finishing touches on your 2025 class right now as it stands caleb cunningham andrew marsh quincy porter and emmanuel choice are going to be in that weekend so that would be a quintet, a quintet 
if <laughs> Cortez Mills ends up coming back. I, I, I thought I saw a tweet where he was quoted as saying he's coming back for an official visit. So I don't know if I did see that or not, but um, yeah, if you get a hold of him, that'll be interesting to hear if that's legit or not. Um, we're going to have a bunch of information for you guys on OU Insider VIP. And right now is probably the best time to sign up because for $9.95, you get four months. So you pay one month, get three months free. Super, super simple deal. $9.95. You go there, you create a free Rivals account. You pay $9.95 and you get all the way to the middle of August. It ends Monday night. So on the 20, April 22nd, over, done, naughty, you cannot sign up. We've had, I think, close to, we just started it yesterday, we had close to 100 people sign up already. Uh, we would love to get a couple of hundred of you guys to sign up and join us. There's already thousands and thousands of OU fans already on there. Uh, there uh, that place is hopping right now. It's fun. There's notes up constantly we've been dropping notes i got transfer portal notes coming like i said uh we've got parker and i will be splitting that list up and going as big as we possibly can to get you guys as much information as we can on nearly 80 visitors so if you want information on OU recruiting 25 26 27 and even 28 classes we're going to have that for you on OU insider if you want transfer portal we have that for you if you want transfer portal for basketball our man brody lusk Beats everybody to the game on that. I promise you, like he is ahead of the game. Basketball, transfer, recruiting, all of it. He's got the goods over there on OU Insider VIP. If you like softball, Jesse, Brian, they cover that. If you like baseball, our man Blake covers that. Like, if you like OU sports, OU Insider VIP is where it's at. Football, basketball, baseball, softball, recruiting, transfer, everything. We got it for you. You stay, you will know everything that's going on behind the scenes, team notes, who's standing out, who's doing what this in, in summer camp, where the coaches are going to go visit and who they're going to go visit on the eval period that starts up here in the next few weeks and will last a month or so. Official visit, who's coming in? How did that visit go? Is OU close to getting commits? All of that will be on OU Insider VIP. We will have discussions. We do Q&As with you guys. Parker's got a chat that he's going to earn a mailbag that he's going to throw up there. I do a mailbag every week and a chat. So like, there's so much that you guys can do. We communicate with you guys in all of the threads too. You ask a question, you start a thread. We click on it. We read it. We'll, we'll, we're going to banner with you guys. We're going to talk with you guys. Super, super accessible. Try to do as best we can to be as open as we can and to make sure the board is always fun for you guys. All right. That's going to do it for this version of the OU Insider Under the Visor Sooners podcast. Even a kind of a post-game podcast as OU held their annual spring game today. It was fun. 45,861 people showed up. Uh, we're going to have more on that over on OU Insider VIP, so come join us. Uh, for Parker Thune, my name is Brandon Drum. You guys have a blessed day. <laughs>